Our first reading this morning is a reminder of our seven UU principles, um, the guiding lights of Unitarian Universalism. Number one, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Number two, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Three, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. Number four, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Five, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. Number six, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. And seven, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Thank Blessed you. Be. Blessed be. Now I enjoy some special music from Molly. Thank you. 
Wow. Thank you so much, Molly and Sojourner on Piano. Um, that was beautiful. Our second reading this morning is called Religion at Its Best, written by Erica A. Hewitt. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> That's not the right one. Written by Sarah Gibb Millspaw. Religion is as much about faith in humanity as it, as it is about faith in deity. And many of us will find that over and over, our faith in humanity gets tested. We are immersed in a culture that's deeply corrupted by selfishness, greed, and oppression-born privilege and fear. It's all too easy for us to justify the dehumanization, ostracization, suffering, and death of others. It's all too easy for us to devalue some humans' lives and feel somehow like we're still good, upstanding, moral people. Religion at its best asks us to do better than this, to rise above the selfishness and status seeking, the othering and xenophobia that comes so easily to us. Religion at its best and our Unitarian Universalist faith calls us to honor that which is sacred in each person, even those we might hate, even those who we find disgusting. It impels us to accept on faith that there is a sacred spark, a worthy spark in every person. This can sound mundane, but it's actually very radical revolutionary even, each person sacred, each person worthy. Accepting this on faith changes how we live. In this time when so many of us live in fear of a dehumanizing political regime, let us renew our pledge to live out those sacred and humane teachings that draw us towards compassion, love, and justice in ever widening circles of care. Blessed be. Good morning and thank you again for having me back in the virtual pulpit this morning. Um, I wanna start out by talking about one of the reasons I chose to study religion when I went to college was because I loved church. And it's fascinating how a church like ours, like this one, and the Westboro Baptist Church, for example, could have any shared roots, could have anything in common at all. And from a fairly young age, I remember being mad that religion, a huge umbrella, got such a bad rap that the churches decrying marriage equality and using their faith as justification to bully and abuse those who believe differently seemed to get all the attention. In middle and high school, I was often reluctant to identify myself as religious because I knew most of my peers had this understandable bias against religion in general. In youth group here at UUSB, I even had peers who felt generally opposed to the idea of religion. They would say of our community that it isn't really a religion so much as a cool, hippie, do what you want, love everybody club. And I love a cool, hippie love club as much as the next guy, but I also loved being part of a religion and feeling like I belonged in this religious community. Even so, I found myself doubting sometimes, are we a real religion? 
I think the popular definition that many of us have grown up with, in America at least, is that religion is based on dogma and more specifically on a shared understanding of God or gods or the goddess. So if we don't have that, how are we a religion? We encourage a plurality of beliefs and we don't force anyone to believe in God or heaven or hell. So I think a lot of people wonder, does not taking a unified stand on those ideas mean we aren't a real religion? I didn't have a good argument for why, despite all of that, Unitarian Universalism really felt like a religion to me. This was until I got to college. One of the very first courses I got to take was Introduction to World Religions, where we read some writings by Ninian Smart, a pioneering scholar in the field of secular religious studies. He actually founded the first religious studies department in all of the United Kingdom. Smart states that it's not productive to think about what religion is in general to come up with one unifying definition. Rather, we should think about what a religion is or has. He claims that there are seven dimensions to a religion, that you can find these seven dimensions to varying degrees of importance in any religion. SMART's dimensions are basically practical, experiential, narrative, doctrinal, ethical, social, and material. I love this way of thinking about religion because it has helped me regain the confidence I wanted to proudly claim that I belong to a religion, and not only a religion, I the best religion. I want to spend most of our time together now walking through these seven dimensions and how I believe our Unitarian Universalist faith fits the definition as defined by SMART. Uh, I'm going to gloss kind of quickly over uh, social and material dimensions because I think they are the, the most straightforward. Social is probably our most prominent dimension. Not only do we prioritize community within our congregations, UUism is composed of many overlapping social groups from small local committees to the UUA. And the material dimension we can see very clearly though uh, maybe not so much recently, in our historical buildings, uh, portraits of Unitarians and Universalists past, um, our flaming chalice, etc. Um, I want to dive in more deeply with the practical dimension, also called the ritual dimension. Smart writes, every tradition has some practices to which it adheres. For instance, regular worship, preaching, prayers, and so on. He also includes in his definition other patterns of behavior which, while they may not strictly count as rituals, fulfill a function in developing spiritual awareness or ethical insight. Practices such as yoga in the Buddhist and Hindu traditions while our Sunday morning worship, I think certainly checks this box, some of my other favorite UU rituals are lighting the chalice, lighting our candles of joys and sorrows. Both of these rituals, I believe, are intended to deepen our spiritual awareness and forge greater connections with one another. And while it looks a lot different nowadays, I don't think there's a UU congregation you could go to that doesn't participate in some way in the 
ritual of uh, coffee hour or social hour that I think is a, a big part of our social dimension as well. The next one I wanna talk about is the experiential, also called the emotional dimension. Smart says, consider the visions of the prophet Muhammad, the conversion of Paul, the enlightenment of the Buddha. He continues, it is obvious that the emotions and experiences of people are the food on which the other dimensions feed. Ritual without feeling is cold. Doctrines without awe or compassion are dry. And myths which do not move hearers are feeble. One of the six Unitarian Universalist sources is direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. Experience and wonder are right there in our sources. As a group, we vehemently uphold and affirm that people's experiences and emotions are central to our spiritual journeys and to the life of the congregation. I believe the emotional and the social dimension are probably the most prominent and influential to our uni Unitarian Universalism. Additionally, our fourth principle is a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. The fact that we don't all have to believe the same thing, I believe increases the importance of our, emotional, of our emotions and direct experiences. I'll return a little more in depth to the principles shortly, but first I want to address the narrative dimension, also called the mythic dimension. Smart describes this as the story side of religion. It is typical of all faiths to hand down vital stories, some historical, some about a mysterious, primordial time when the world was in its timeless dawn, some about things to come at the end of time, some about great heroes and saints. Now, one question I've gotten asked a lot by people who are just now learning about Unitarian Universalism is, do you believe in the Bible? And my answer is usually something along the lines of, you can. No one is, no is going to try and stop you. One of the most beautiful parts of our faith, in my opinion, is that we draw from the wisdom of the world's religions, which inspire us in our ethical and spiritual life. We don't limit ourselves to a single story about the universe. We are open to the lessons from all kinds of myths and stories. Not only that, we do have our own UU lore. It may not be written down as a sacred text or consistently preached about in every congregation, but I would bet most of us have heard at some point the story of John Murray, the universalist minister who arrived in America ready to give up preaching forever having lost his son and been excommunicated from his church in England. The story goes that John Murray met a like-minded man who believed John had been sent to preach the doctrine of universal salvation in the chapel he built years ago. John Murray said he would not uh, be preaching and that he would be setting sail again as soon as the winds were strong enough but the winds didn't pick up. And by the time Sunday rolled around, John found himself in the pulpit once again and began what was to become the universalist movement in America. I think another good example is the story I shared in our Time for All Ages. We as a, as a religious community make sacred the stories of visionaries 
and scientists who often risk their lives to create the world and knowledge we enjoy today. Now the final two dimensions, doctrinal and ethical, are deeply intertwined in most cases, but especially in Unitarian Universalism. This is also the sticking point for some UUs and non-UUs alike. We may check all the other boxes, but we don't have a doctrine. We are a special creedless faith and that's a major draw for many who have found a home in Unitarian Universalist congregations around the world. But like the rest of the dimensions, SMART gives the doctrinal another name. He also calls this the philosophical dimension. And I would argue that our seven principles constitute a loosely shared philosophy. Now, our principles are not and should not be enforced like a doctrine. You do not have to uh, you know, state that you agree with them to become a member of a UU congregation. And we are not in the business of policing anyone's relationship to the principles. However, we do lean on them to guide this religious community. Yes, we affirm everyone's individual search for truth and meaning. But if your search brings you to the conclusion that same-sex couples shouldn't be married in our church, or that white people are superior to people of color, we wouldn't accept those views being promoted within our congregation. We would not, we, we do not tolerate intolerance. And I know that that's an uncomfortable paradox, but it's a necessary one. So again, I, I see us as having a philosophy, a unified vision, even if it is a kind of nebulous and complicated one. And that brings us to our uh, final dimension, ethical or legal. While we don't promote any religious laws like purity codes or restrictions on people's behavior, we certainly care and think deeply about ethics. SMART says, not all traditions are tied to a system of law, but all still display an ethic. While of course no one is ever forced to participate, you use con consistently show up in force to support ethical social movements. We often fight for the future of our planet, for laws and policies which protect the civil rights of all. And this is nothing new. Unitarians and Universalists actively participated in the civil rights movement, in the anti-war movement. Um, more recently, we saw Reverend Dr. Susan Frederick Ray, president of the UUA, right at the forefront of those protesting arm in arm with each other, the white supremacists in Charlottesville in the summer of 2017. In all of this, I see a shared ethic informed by our principles and our history. So in my job at Wheaton College, I have two roles. My primary role is as the interfaith engagement coordinator. And my secondary role involves programming for the wellness themed living and learning community. These roles sometimes overlap in a fun way because one of the things we talk about in the wellness community is spiritual wellness. When I talk about spiritual wellness in the context of my job, I often talk about it in terms of clarifying your values and then living your life and making choices in line with those values. So in that context, I really think 
we are all uh, on a spiritual journey, regardless of religious affiliation or lack thereof. And so I'm, I'm brought back to the comments I remember my peers making about this church, about this religion. Just, just being a place where we love everyone and accept everyone and can just do whatever we want. While I totally see where they're coming from, if that really was all there is to it, every loving, open-minded person in the world would technically be a Unitarian Universalist. And there's just, there's more to it than that. Not having a doctrine doesn't mean we're not a religion and it's just a free-for-all. We, as a religion, share a long and rich history in all of the dimensions as laid out by Ninian Smart. I loved studying religion in college because not only did it give me some insights into other religions, it gave me even more faith in mine. A slow but relentless goal that I have is to not let conservative and sometimes hateful religious communities claim the mantle of religiosity all for themselves. To live my religion proudly and shift the perception that religion is a predominantly negative force in society. While we cannot deny that religions have historically helped perpetuate great harm all over the world, inciting wars and even acts of genocide, religious people have and will continue to fight for love and justice and peace. And I am proud that we as Unitarian Universalists get to play a role in that. Thank you and blessed be. I invite us now to shift our attention and join in uh, singing our closing hymn when the lyrics appear up on our screen, um, a favorite hymn of mine, when our heart is in a holy place.
Beautiful. Um, thank you all for being here this morning and for your very kind words in the chat. Uh, thank you for taking this hour out of your week to be with this community, to hold space for our joys and sorrows and for reflecting with me on what it means to be a part of this religious community. As I read our closing words, written by Andrew Pakula, I invite you to take a deep breath and breathe out slowly to extinguish our flaming chalice. As you prepare to leave this sacred space, pack away a piece of this church in your heart. Wrap it carefully like a precious gem. Carry it with you through the joys and sorrows of our days. Let its gentle glow strengthen you, warm you, remind you that, remind you of all that is good and true until you gather here again in this place of love. Blessed be, amen. Now we will join in our sung benediction. We'd like to thank everyone who came together to make this such a wonderful service this morning. Uh, Kaylee as our worship leader, Molly and Sojourner doing that fabulous job with the music. 